Hi everyone, I hope you can hear us. Welcome to our, to our online lecture with Gary Montanko. So um, I'm very pleased to welcome you today. My name is Charlotte. I'm one of the guides at the National Botanic Gardens in Glasnevin. And I had the pleasure of working with Gary for a few years. Uh, he used to be a guide in Glasnevin, in the Botanic Gardens. Uh, prior to that, he uh, did a degree with Chagas College of Amenity Horticulture. And I think there's a few students and staff here today. And um, it was wonderful working with Gary because his knowledge and his passion for plants runs deep. And he was able to share that with his colleagues and also with all the people he met with as a guide. And I would say one of his lasting legacies with us is his biophilia tour. So um, biophilia is something that really influenced me and some of the other guides. It's the idea um, that people are strongly connected to nature. We're a part of nature. And um, so it's, it's really great to hear from him today. He's gonna to talk about JFK Arboretum, uh, which is another Office of Public Works managed site in Ireland. So we're strongly connected and we're under the same management in the Botanic Gardens. So um, it's really great to connect because even pre-COVID, it's not always possible for us to visit each other. So I think it's important um, for Office of Public Works staff and the wider audience to, to um, share our stories about different sites. So um, just before we start, a small amount of housekeeping. So um, a lot of you are saying hello there today in the chat box. It's great to see. And my colleague, Kira Travers, OPW is there and she will kind of keep an eye on everything and make sure everyone's getting on all right. So if there's any technical issues, if you can't hear us, you can chat to Kira and you can also actually phone us if you need to as well. So our phone number is 01804-0319. And but hopefully everything should go fine. If you have questions for Gary, we would ask you please to go to the ask a question box at the bottom of the screen there. And if you type it in there, it means that at the end of the talk, we will go there and we'll see what the questions are and put them to Gary. And you can also vote for your favorite question. So if somebody else asks a question you were thinking of yourself, you can upvote it. So we'll start by answering the questions that are most popular when we get to that. And um, so do bear in mind, questions go into ask a question and general conversation uh, can take place in the chat box. There's also a poll there. We were quite curious to see how many of you have visited JFK. Um, so you might uh, click your answer in there if you feel like it. And yeah, I'm gonna hand you over to Gary and he's a wonderful presentation. We can see already there in the corner. Um, so I'll talk to you again at the end when we do the Q&A. So I'm gonna hand you over now. Okay, all right. Um, well, uh, thank you very much everyone for, for joining us um, online for this. I'm just uh, having, having a bit of a, a calm down after terrible tech, uh, but we, I think we started it out in the end. So, um, like Charlotte said, my name is Gary Mutanko. I'm a craft gardener at the John F. Kennedy Arboretum, which is down in Wexford. It's just 10 kilometers outside of um, New Ross. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about its history and uh, talk about the, um, I suppose, the ongoing work that we're doing. I'll try to highlight some important collections that we have, as well as um, just choice plants that, that that I see kind of every day or throughout the year that capture my eye, and uh, I'd like to share them with you. And we're going to talk about um, its origins and um, importance of plant conservation and some of the threats that plants, um, particularly trees and shrubs, have to, um, uh, to deal with in our modern world. So um, we'll start the presentation from here. Um, you can see from my uh, beginning slide here, there's two monkey puzzle trees which are in front of our visitor center. And um, these uh, were here actually before the establishment of the Arboretum, which was 53 years ago. Um, they, um, there was a, originally it was a, an estate, a Ballysop house, and this was, these trees were um, uh, on the drive on the way up to the house. But we'll, we'll talk a bit about that as we go on. So. Um, the reason the Arboretum exists <clears throat> is because of this man, of course, John F. Kennedy. His, uh, his, he comes from um, a line of Irish, uh, I'm sure everyone knows that. Uh, uh, his ancestors uh, emigrated to uh, America uh, from, a, from a local area here called Dungenstown. And in 1963, Kennedy uh, visited Ireland and came to New Ross, came to Dugginstown, went to New Ross um, to see the people. And I think he was a real, I mean, he was the most powerful man in the world and he was this beacon of hope for the Irish. He represented a lot of, 
uh, you know, the aspirations that people had when they they had immigrated to the new world. So, um, so Kennedy visited, and um, unfortunately, he died uh, only five months later. So it, it left a really uh, uh, strong feeling with people, uh, particularly people of uh, of Wexford. Uh, so there were uh, predominant Irish American societies that wanted to raise funds to pay tribute to him uh, back in Ireland, and uh, it was uh, it was decided that it would be uh, a collection of trees, a national arboretum. We'll just take a look at a quote here that Kennedy once said: "I'm reminded of the story of the great French Marshal Luthier, who once asked his gardener to plant a tree." The gardener objected that the tree was slow growing and would not reach maturity for a hundred years. The marshal replied, in that case, there's no time to lose. Plant it this afternoon. And uh, there's also another quote that Martin Luther King uh, once said, which was that if he, um, the world was ending tomorrow, he would plant an apple tree today. So these are very like positive, very life affirmation types of, of, of feelings. And, and I, I think Kennedy himself represented a lot of hope progress, scientific achievement uh, during that time. So uh, an arboretum seems actually quite suited for, uh, for him. So uh, al along one of the people who had um, been involved in helping raise some of the funds is this man here, Tony Hannon, who was our first director. Now he was a forester, traveled the countrywide, um, had previously worked at Powers Court, and um, he was tasked with uh, himself and a committee of um, uh, kind of a forestry committee had uh, to travel the world and learn from other uh, large collections of trees, other arboretum around the world. So they went to America and all throughout Europe um, to sort of uh, pinpoint what would uh, what sort of thing would you have here in, in the um, in Wexford. And um, Hannon uh, was was a very passionate man. Unfortunately, he had um, he didn't really he didn't live to see the arboretum really flourish he 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 um his he was tasked with this work in the early 60s and he passed away unfortunately in 1972. so um may 19th 1968 de valera opened the uh, arboretum he had actually attempted to uh, have a national arboretum established in kilmacurra in the 1940s but um due to a a, a sale which fell through uh, that didn't happen so this was this was in his mind, particularly a really good, um, a good way to commemorate the life of John F. Kennedy, you know, bringing people together, bringing uh, plants together, plants growing near one another from around the world. It it, it sort of has this, this sort of uh, encompassing um, metaphor of of what I suppose you would call it of a, a global community. So I think it, it's a. It's good to take a look at this uh, photo just for a moment. This is um, an aerial shot uh, just a few years after the establishment. You can see kind of in the top center uh, area there, some of the first forestry plots that were planted and the building down in uh, the right here, uh, which we had seen in the first slide. There was an old um, woodland in the center, which was kept and we still have quite a few of the old uh, very large oak trees. There's also some very large beech that are kind of at the end of their life. And you can see uh, the plantings um, all throughout here. This is what is now the eucalyptus collection. Uh, there were three trees planted of every type, some cases five, um, to ensure that we would, um, that, they, that they would continue on. I suppose the idea was that out of the three, you, you'd be lucky to get one very good tree out of it. And you can see these large bands of trees and uh, this is a very windy site. So um, kind of nursery trees were put in to, to nurse the plants. They would uh, create a shelter belt in order to uh, allow the, the new plantings to get uh, a foothold. And um, one of our, our former director, Chris Kelly, um, spent a lot of time uh, analyzing uh, the wind patterns over the years and, and um, documented this massive drop off of, of wind um, in subsequent decades. Now it's been 53 years. A lot of these shelter belts are still there. And um, in some cases they're, they're in desperate need to be taken out. So they're, they're, they've fulfilled their purpose. The arboretum is mature. And what's happened is that they, um, in a lot of cases, the plants that grew close to them um, have been overshadowed trees get tall, some of them get sick, 
we have a lot of storms, they fall over, and they can damage our specimens. So these are things that, um, you know, there's no, there's no shortage of jobs that need to be done at the Arboretum. And then this is a shot of what it would look like uh, nowadays. And this is the eucalyptus collection uh, here in the bottom part of the, the screen. And looking up uh, to the right, going up to the slopes of Sleeve Quilture, there's also our very large eucalyptus um, plot collection. So um, what we're going to do is we'll talk a bit about uh, the, the collection. It's quite vast. Um, there's a tax of 4,500 of um, specimens and cultivars. And I think the intention originally was to expand that to anywhere between 5,000 and 6,000. So it's a very, we would be considered one of the largest collections of trees and shrubs uh, in the world. Um, so that's uh, growing the collection to represent all different types that is that are actually capable of being grown in the Irish climate is definitely something that, um, a, a job that will really never end. There is also uh, 190 forest plots that, um, grow around uh, the Arboretum and up the mountain. In terms of the size, it's uh, we're quite large. It'd be about one third the size, I suppose, of Phoenix Park, so 623 acres. We have quite a few trees which have been deemed champions, so the largest uh, of their types uh, in girth or height um, through Ireland and Britain. We have 13 ground staff uh, which, which uh, manage the place and our visitor numbers are quite large, 110,000. Now that's that would be the 19. Uh, that would be the the 2019 num numbers. I last year, I, I we're not, I'm not sure what they are, but we were a real haven for for people to come out um, and um, get exercise. So I would wouldn't be surprised if it was more than that. And this is a little map which is a or orienteering, just to give you a sense of what the arboretum looks like. Your top. Left-hand corner, some of the plots from North and South America uh, trees, um, and all of the European and Asian plants would be growing up the mountain. We have a very long vista, which grow, which goes is a kilometer long, and a road which uh, takes most of the the visitors around. But there's quite a few intersecting paths uh, go throughout it. And yes, Sleep Quilcha is a is a hill that's across the road from from uh, us, which we also manage. And again, that's. Uh, that was bought at a later stage and uh, trees were added in um, uh, different plots. So we'll take a moment just to talk about what is an arboretum. And uh, it's not it's not what you would just think is just a bunch of trees, or we say it's, it's actually a curated collection of, of trees and shrubs. So these are ones which are, um, which, which preferably come from a wild source a known wild source. Um, that way, when you have that plant, it gives you a representation of what um, the genetic profile of the plants from that area are from. And we'll talk a bit more about conservation later on and a lot of the threats that plants have, but um, it's a backup for when um, there are natural disasters or man-made disasters, development which um, change an area and uh, the plant no longer grows there. So uh, it's curated, the things are selected. Um, we grow things that we don't have. We grow them from wild sources. We do grow cultivars, things that would have um, some manner of notable use. Beauty would certainly be one of them, but if a plant was resistant to disease, that would um, immediately catch our eye for being a, a, um, a plant that we would get in. Uh, or something that has a dis distinctive foliage, some, something uh, extra special about them. Um, the Arboretum's purpose is to um, is to be there for something like, say, demonstration. Um, in, in Ireland, we have quite a few people growing um, forestry plots of trees and wanting to know what a tree will um, look like over time and what its growth rates are. Um, conservation, we'll, we'll touch on uh, la later on. Uh, education. Uh, through bringing um, students in, uh, whether they be children, um, teens, or ones that are going on and studying uh, horticulture or um, in the forestry sector. Um, it's an enormous outdoor classroom. It has the ability to do where people can do science in a way that can't be done in, in a class, in a small garden. It, it actually needs um, the amount of space that we have. We are involved uh, or have been um, used in, in quite a bit of research, which I'll also touch on later on. And of course, 
I'm going to talk a lot about this in a scientific kind of way or or our use as, as a scientific collection, but we are an important uh, recreation, an amenity space for people uh, from, from the area, from around the country. And like Charlotte had said, I have a real interest in um, biophilia, the idea that we've we've evolved um, in, in, in conjunction with plants, we've relied on them, and they, um, they have something that, um, they have something, it, it, we can't live without them. There's been, there's been lots of studies that have shown that people living in areas where there's no greenery, no plants, have shorter life uh, spans, have higher incidence of depression, anxiety, mental, um, mental issues. So um, I, I, I never want to, to, to make it seem that the, the Arboretum is, isn't there for, for the people because it certainly is. But we do all of this stuff. Uh, this, we do all this stuff, which is, uh, which is scientific, but it's, it, it's still beautiful for people. I, I just want to also pause for a moment just to just say, like, why should we uh, conserve trees? And this graphic here, not all of it is relevant to this talk here, gives you a sense of, of all the things that a single tree would do with, in terms of biophilia, what I'd said socially of boosting mood, allowing for somewhere to be um, a place of recreation, um, something that has a beautiful aesthetics. You know, uh, if you're involved in, in gardens or whatever, you can in, in increase a sense of community. Uh, it's important for shelter for habitats for animals. It's a, something where we get food from in terms of, um, let's say, apple trees. It's important in the trees would be important in the nutrient cycle, um, bringing nitrogen from the air into the soil. In, uh, it allows to uh, prevent uh, floods in um, improving water infiltration, filters out pollution from the air. I mean, you know, shade and temperature control, carbon sequestration when um, we have very high levels of um, CO2 in the atmosphere. So there's, there's, there's lots of different things that a single tree can do. And when we look at some of the, the dire things that are happening around the world with um, deforestra deforestation, you, you, you sort of, um, you have to think of, you know, what, what are we doing to this, this world that, that we're meant to be stewards for protecting. So what I thought is I'll, I'll kind of break up the talk and talk a bit about some of the important collections and plants. And then later on, I'll talk about a few specimens. So uh, one of the larger collections that we have is the Ericaceous Gardens, uh, which includes a, a great deal of um, rhododendrons and uh, azaleas. Um, the collection would consist of somewhere between five to 600 different types. And um, it's one of the more popular um, areas. So. Uh, Former curator of the National Botanic Gardens, Tommy Crawford, was tasked with designing a, a garden for JFK, and um, he, Tony Hannon, was was very pleased with the, the results, and he was paid in in the money of the time, 150 pounds, uh, towards it. And Hannon felt that he, he he wanted to really push in order to make sure Crawford got paid uh, promptly because he was so pleased with with the work that uh, he'd done. So it's a very good, I think, aerial shot of showing um, the collection. And uh, not only uh, with rhododendrons and uh, azaleas, it includes lots of other plants that grow in acidic conditions, which is, which is uh, very conducive for our soil, which is kind of a, a, a brown, brown earth, which I think the, the pH would be 5.8. So things like Arbutus, Pyres, Caltheria, Pernetia, Ericas, Leophyllum, and uh, Oxydendron, uh, this is kind of a sour leaf uh, tree, all grow in here. And it would be one of the more, uh, re really one of the most visited parts of the, the collection throughout um, the months of, of April and May. And you can see how, how people uh, quite, quite enjoy it. I'll show you just a few plants that, that, that catch my eye throughout the year, Rhododendron, Mollus Christopher Wren, beautiful, uh, bright, uh, bright flowers in, in the sunlight and on a rainy day. It, it seems like the sun's coming from it. There's, uh, there's not only just this uh, Azalea Karumi, we have quite a few different uh, cultivars of it, but this one I thought was a really uh, great uh, show of, of uh, flowering. And so much so, I, I didn't actually get the cult of our name at the time because I didn't want to go in and disturb any of the petals. It sort of looks so so perfect. Uh, we also grow uh, Calmia uh, latifolia. This is an American 
bush, which uh, is also referred to as spoonwood. It's very slow growing, extremely dense um, timber. And I, I quite like this because the, the flowers to me look, you know, manufactured. They, they look like something which has um, been made in a cast, particularly before the flowers uh, open up. We have a, a bed of Enchianthus, uh, which is, um, this one this is quite a beautiful Chinese plant. And then we also have a Japanese Enchianthus, uh, Cyrenus. This is a cultivar called Rubens. This is the, the color change in the autumn, which is quite spectacular. One of my favorite rhododendrons is this Cinnabarium. Um, and uh, this is a Joseph Hooker uh, introduction in the 1840s. This is quite a variable uh, species. They, they, uh, they can come in yellows. They can be, be more tubular, much more, um, much more compact. They can also have quite, quite a bright uh, red color to them. Has a very nice uh, scent to, to the, the leaves, uh, the dead leaves as well. This is a variety called Blandiflorum. Then you have curious things like this. I'm not really sure if azalodendron is, is botanically a, uh, a recognized name uh, any longer, but I, I included it here on our old records. It's uh, referred to as azalodendron azaleoides. So not only do we have uh, a collection such as that, one of my favorites uh, is this low growing conifer collection. And if any of you have ever seen any of the talks I've done previously, you'll know that I'm interested in alpine plants. So I, um, this is the, these are the alpine plants of, of the, the tree world. And these are conifers which naturally, in their natural state, have a, a slow growth rate, or they've been selected out uh, as cultivars, say sports, um, witches brooms, growing off of a, a plant, a plant's person notices it and grafts it onto another piece of material and uh, grows it on, it become, becomes a cultivar. And what I love about this area is that it's just, you might just walk past and you go like, oh, it's a bunch of little trees, but um, it's extremely variable in texture, in direction of the, the, the uh, foliage growth, texture of the foliage, texture of colors. I find it very, very rich. This is a, just a shot of what it would have looked like in the 70s when it was uh, first constructed. And you can see how uh, mature it, it's gotten now. And I, it's, it's, it's something that sort of changes color throughout the day as you're looking at the sunlight. Again, it, it's all about texture. I, I, I just, I get really, um, I have a real interest in, the, in this sort of texture and the people talk about like the 40 shades of green in, in Ireland, but like this is, this is, this adds hundreds of more shades of green um, altogether. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can see the difference. These are both chamois cyparis um, cultivars. I think the, um, the drooping one is uh, Pisifera Pisifera, and the upturned uh, one is Obtusa, but um, it shows you the difference um, just together of uh, how these can grow. There's two that I, I, I really like, Juniperus um, Recurva coxii, which was, um, I don't know if it was, she was in, she is credited with discovering it. Charlotte uh, Wheeler Cuff, uh, I think, saw it in Burma um, in the early 20th century. It was introduced by someone else, but I think you can credit her. She, she, had, she had painted it, uh, what she called the coffin tree, because it was, um, the timber was quite, um, it's quite fragrant and is, uh, was used in, in the construction of coffins. And I quite like this uh, Pinus sylvestris, uh, the Scots pine, but this is a, a cultivar called Aurea. And um, it's green all throughout the year, but as the winter months come on, it gets this really great blazing yellow color. What I like about this as well is that if you collect the seed from this, the yellow color comes through when you grow on the plant. Whereas a lot of cultivars, if you collect the seed and grow them, they, they won't have the features that um, you have in front of you with, with the tree. They actually revert back to what their species type is. The maple collection is quite extensive. It, it includes, uh, I believe it's 120 different types of uh, species and cultivars. If anyone hasn't been to JFK, I mean, I, I would advocate anyone to come at any time of the year, springtime, obviously, to see the rhododendrons. But if you're in the area for September, October, the best maple collection uh, of, um, of, of color, change of color you'll see in the country. And this also has incredible uh, variety of, uh, of color and shades. These Dissectum, Asum 
palm autumns are, are, are just something else. Um, yeah, in, in you can you could walk through and you could find 20 other uh, acers which have in, as interesting uh, foliage as these. We also have a hydrangea collection, which is in four very large beds and uh, another, it's, it's sort of hidden in the center of the Arboretum, but um, there's this blue wave of color, blues and whites and the in-betweens, which uh, really stand out. Uh, another, another really choice area to visit. We also have a garden which is dedicated to Augustine Henry, who was an Irish um, plant hunter. I mean, I, he was Scottish, but the, 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 they claim, <laughs> this country claims him uh, because of all the work that he had done for uh, Irish forestry and for all of the plants that he discovered when he traveled uh, the Yangtze River in China. So it's a small area, it's kind of hidden and it's not actually signposted, but it includes some of the plants which he had either introduced himself or had seen in, in nature and, uh, and some plants which people had named for him, um, but to which grew in the regions of China that he had, uh, that he had traveled. So Rhododendron auriculatum, which was the one that we saw on the previous page there. And a really elegant spirea, which was named after um, Henry I. And this, um, in order to get it to grow like this, and I've, I've learned this from, from experience, you have to allow it to, to grow um, mature for, for a couple of years so that you can get this kind of really elegant sweeping um, growth on it. So I, I think I'll take a moment to talk a bit about the, the ground operations that the staff are, are working on here. And here is myself, uh, and in the center, uh, Ray Higginbotham, and on the right, Daniel Goulborn, um, and we're the um, craft gardeners. So the, I, I guess I'll look at it from the point of view of, we were hired with the idea that the Arboretum, Arboretum was running fine and was still a beautiful place, but that some of the collections had become quite overgrown and needed to be restored. And so when we were hired, I suppose the idea was that we were told, this is work that you'll have for the rest of your careers. If you stay here, you have 25 years worth of work ahead of you. So our intention is to go through collection by collection, prune them back, prune them in a very specific way so that you don't prune them too hard and kill the plant. You have to make sure that you have that these plants um, stay at the Arboretum, whether we're going to have to propagate that before we actually go in and do work, um, you know, or, or, or are we deciding that we've got a loss here and we'll have to source seed if possible from um, another Arboretum. So that, 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 that's a lot of the work that, that, that we do. Uh, this is, I think, uh, one of the shelter belt trees which fell over in the Catalpa collection. And um, this is just, uh, this is, this is the, the, the unglamorous part of, 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 of the work, which is, the removal of trees and um, creation of mulch. So actually looking at it through this, um, this would be a perfect example, the Ellie Agnes collection, which a lot of people might know for being used as hedging, can be very dense um, growth. Um, we have a, a, a quite a large collection that had grown out, out, kind of out, out of control. It had grown in together, so you no longer could tell what was what. And then if a plant has fallen over and hits the ground, it's possible that it might root there. And if that plant is rooting within another one, you know, what, what, what are we actually doing? We, we, the plants need to be um, grown botanically. They, they, they need to be able to, to uh, someone needs to be able to, to find the plant they're looking for, to be able to find the label. So this was a, a very, very uh, intensive type of, type of job. I suppose what's important is that when you're going in, there's a certain amount of brute force that you're going in and cutting and cutting, but you also have to be aware of exactly what you're doing because what if uh, these plants are all labeled or, or uh, almost all of them are because the label may have been lost years ago and if we end up pruning too fast and not paying attention to what happens you make you lose the label and then you might lose your knowledge of what the plant is now we do have maps but what if the plant has moved i suppose through through what i said through layering what, what if what if it had layered and the original plant has died and now it's over there? And what if it's not that different from the plant that is growing five feet away from it? It's a cultivar which has, has a feature which perhaps um, uh, is, is, is difficult to, to ascertain. 
so there's there's all, there's all these things. So I'm going to show these next few slides, which is this work. So you can see the big sort of difference from there of uh, of cutting that back. And we'll take a look at the photo from the opposite point of view. And this is right by the road. And you want people to come to the Arboretum and see beautiful things. You you don't want them to um, to see that that we're we're not doing our jobs. So there you can see it um, cut back. And once you revisit it grass put in and the beds mulched up. We are involved with a lot of storm recovery. I mean, I, I started after Ophelia, so I heard legends of all of this enormous storm. I, I was was there for the, the tail end a couple months later of all the, of the trees that had come down in this um, in this event. And, and I had heard of Darwin as well, which had decimated some of the um, the trees in the North American plots. So um, we have to be careful in in making sure that it's a safe place for, for the public to visit. On top of that, you have to keep in mind what I said earlier. If you have trees which are falling over, can we keep that tree on site through propagation um, or through judicious pruning, staking, etc.? So you can see this. This is from Ophelia. Uh, this is one of the the trees that I had shown in the center woodland that had uh, uprooted from uh, a major storm. We also have after uh, Ophelia, there was that snowy winter with three years ago, enormous amount of snow coming down on top of uh, trees which are evergreen. This one being uh, Cryptomeria uh, caused quite a bit of, of damage. And Going back to the snow slow growing conifers, you can see on the left where snow has fallen, not very much of it, um, but on the right where it's been knocked off using um, just rakes and sticks in order to ensure that it doesn't uh, stay on it. Because, and in particularly with, with this collection, if, if the snow is to stay and the plant deforms and the uh, stays in that position for a period of time and then the temperatures rise, the plant doesn't necessarily go back to its original form and it becomes unsightly. In Japan, they have a, a, a different method for um, for preventing this, which I would love to do uh, for, for a handful of trees in the Arboretum. They call it um, yukit uh, suri, which are tree suspenders. And this allows uh, the trees to uh, to not have a buildup of, uh, of snow. And this is what it looks like uh, throughout the winter time. So uh, the planting season, this is one of the most important parts uh, of the job that we're involved in. We, um, we, we, over the years, there's been lots of plants which invariably die through uh, pest and disease, uh, through uh, you know, droughts. Uh, possibly the plant is not pl planted in the right place. Possibly that plant is not hardy to the Irish climate. So we spend a good amount of time re researching what was where in the Arboretum and trying to replicate it and, of course, add to it uh, with things that we don't have. Um, so uh, the underneath the words planting season, you can see a stone there, 128. The entire Arboretum was gridded out in about 140 grids. They are uh, gr grid stones were put in the soil and they're 61 meters um, separate. So when we're looking for a plant, we want to know what grid it's in. And um, these grid stones have vanished over the years, They're just from um, a buildup of humus and soil on top of it. So we spend a lot of time doing triangulation, trying to find the grid stone, because when you're going to plant something out, you need to know where is it going? What number is it going to get when it goes out into the field? Which grid is it actually in? And then once you know that, then you can allocate it its, um, its label, it, it, it's, it's given an accession number, and it goes out into the field. So. For the, a lot of times you could go out and you could look out easily say, oh, well, that's fine. That tree will go in 21G. But what about all of the trees that are in that little margin of, of, of where these grids are? So triangulation to find these grids, we, we, we do that from um, the mature trees that have been there for 53 years. Then once we have the grid, then we can be a lot more accurate. Um, yeah, and we, we, we use a, a metal detector as well. Most of them have a little bit of pig iron on them. And sometimes we can find them from that. It's about 50 50. Um, so, yeah, so, so we spend a lot of time doing that. Our planting season, well, let's see, March, we'd be researching what's going where 
for the end of March into April. It's quite short because we did it, it when it goes, our site goes from being very wet to very dry uh, extremely quickly. So we don't plant out that much. Most of the planting happens um, at the end of September into October. Um, and I thought I would be instructive just to talk about the kind of planting standards that we have. So many times I've have I heard the phrase, well, plant, you know, if you, if you plant that in the ground, it, it'll just grow. And that's not necessarily the case. One of the things that we've discovered over time, particularly what um, Daniel Goldburn, who's one of my colleagues, who's uh, an arborist, has found that the trees on the site in certain cases were planted too deeply. Now, this this was the old um, knowledge of, of what to, to do, that, that you plant it deeply and it, it's, it's nice to firm in the soil. And that's not actually very good for, for almost all trees to being plant um, a little, little bit higher than it should be allows for the tree to create buttresses at its base, which strengthen the tree. Wind stresses um, cause hormonal changes and uh, chemicals are sent in order to create better uh, buttresses. So we, we have found trees. I, I, I can tell you an example. If you see a tree ever, which looks like a telephone pole, that is to say it's completely tapered straight into the soil. That tree has been planted too deeply. And what you're looking at is a tree which is stunted uh, it would have been much bigger or in much better shape had it been up, I guarantee it. But like I say, with um, planting standards, we follow a very similar standard that is done at Kew Gardens, which is time consuming. But if we're putting the amount of time into growing a plant from seed or purchasing it, if it's a good cultivar, and you want that to give its best chance, then you need to give it the best kind of uh, uh, you know, standard that you can. So just for an example of this, uh, we would uh, start off with cutting the grass as low as possible, basically scraping the ground. We edge a circle 180 centimeters in diameter um, and remove the top two inches of sod. A lot of people would say, well, why would you take this, the, the sod away? We actually are fortunate having some of the best soil in all of Ireland. It's a very, very deep brown earth soil. So this soil, it's not wasted. It, it, it goes somewhere else uh, where there's um, ruts and holes um, in the Arboretum. We dig a square hole and score the sides of it. Plants that are growing in pots have a tendency to grow um, around the, the pot in a circular way. And if you put them in a ground in a round hole, they have a tendency to continue to grow in that sense. They don't grow out and they don't become strong plants. We have it obviously centered in the hole and uh, several inches above the grass line. So the, the, it's obviously going to sink a little bit, but we still don't want that um, that root flare to go below um, too full, far below the, the soil. Then we backfill it, tamp it down with our boot and level it off. Staking and caging, we use, uh, we use this plastic um, caging material, which is not, I suppose it's not ideal, it's not ecologically that sound the only thing about it is that it's very hard wearing it's very long lasting and we reuse it so it, it it's going to have um years and years of life um before it ever needs to be removed and it's much as easier to work with than um than, than metal and uh we have an annual it gets it gets a mulch um and it goes on a list of um uh, of an aftercare program which gets revisited uh every, every year remulched again we see whether there's weeds within it um, uh, to sort of feed it and, and to prevent, uh, you know, so, uh, from uh, transpiration from the soil, from, from dryness. So here's some photos of Ray uh, doing it off. We sort of cut it like a pizza and slice it off. There it is, a circle. And there Ray is planting, um, I think that's a cornus, cornus cusa mistatomi, and then putting in the stakes at a slight angle inwards and bringing the cage around. Another thing with the cage is that, well, it does two things. You know, uh, it prevents the mowers or any strimmers going near these new plants, but we also have quite a rabbit problem on the site. So it keeps them out. So here's, I thought, uh, an instructive thing as well. We've had quite a few dignitaries, Michael D uh, being one of them, and a lot of the people from the Kennedy family and the Onassis family that have come and planted trees over the years. But what happens if you, um, you know, the, the, you plant the tree where 
it's photogenic. And then what happens to that tree? Well, it's supposed to be moved, but sometimes things uh, don't work out that way. So this oak tree was planted eight years ago. And um, we anticipated that it needed to be moved because it's it's too close to the building. So in the year before its, its removal, we trimmed out uh, about a third of the roots underneath, undercut them to stimulate more root growth, which is closer to the, the base of the tree to create kind of a root ball and not stress the plant out entirely. So once we had that, we had to use a machine in order to make a little ramp because it was much too big in order to get up. We fashioned together this uh, basket or a cinch in order to be able to drag it up that slope because uh, six people couldn't uh, remove it. We had to bring it down into its new area, which had been pre-dug in order to be able to um, in order to be able to find its new home. And there you go. Uh, something that's that large, it takes quite a bit of while to find the right level. Again, not planting it too deep. Oh, and I'll go back there. And th there it is that there with uh, Dan on the left and Tony Cullen, who was uh, recently retired. He was our longest serving member of staff who had been there for 43 years. <clears throat> and uh, there you go, 2013, moved in 2020. I'll take a moment to look at a few more specimens that I think are, are quite good uh, on site. Betula grossa is a Japanese uh, tree. This collection of, of birch are, are uh, amongst my favorite. And we have several rare ones, such as um, Betula daricum, and um, Betula radiana, uh, but uh, Grossa is the one is the sort of showstopper. What's great about it as well is that it has um, its leaves, or sorry, its uh, its wood has a kind of winter mint smell. It's a nice little feature, but it's one of the first ones to go yellow. And uh, it, it, when when I, when I talk, I mentioned sunshine in a, on a dim day, but this is really like the one plant that uh, that really shines. We have this curious uh, oak relative, uh, Castanopsis uh, sabolii. This is another Japanese plant. Um, it's somewhat in common in gardens and somewhat in common at the size that we have it at. Um, really nice little uh, leathery leaves and some of the new leaves grow. It has a kind of brown tinge to it, um, but really good growing just off of the, the road near the oak collection. We have the Chilean, uh, these both South American plants, Chilean fire plant and Bothrium um, coccinium. Uh, you wouldn't notice it throughout the year. They're, they're located behind the eucalyptus collection, um, just on the margin of, 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 a, of a, a forest that's there that separates out uh, some of our collections. But um, it, in the summertime, it really, uh, really shows its, uh, its, stuff, its, its stuff. It's, it's pretty spectacular. And then another great, a little plant, Weinmania uh, trichosperma, has these delicate uh, fern-like leaves and very, very uh, fragrant uh, white flowers. That would be located, um, it's kind of hidden away at, uh, in the Arboretum, it's near our Escalonia collection. Well, one of our uh, previous, we used to have a, a record for a, uh, a tree which was um, the uh, champion tree for Acacia delbata, which unfortunately had come down in a storm, but we do have another very good specimen at the gates of Sleeve Quilcha go going up the mountain. This is another really great architectural plant, Daphnephylum macropodum, and you don't normally see it at this size. That's actually what, what one of the great things with the Arboretum is, is that you have the opportunity to see plants that um, are perhaps much bigger than you'd see them in uh, any of the gardens that you'd see throughout throughout the country. It's a dioecious plant, so uh, the male and female parts are on separate plants. So the uh, female would be on the left and the male on the right. So we're actually looking at two different trees here. And there's actually a slight um, color difference between these two specimens. I'll give you a close up of those. So they're there with, with the, uh, the leaves, <clears throat> sorry, with the, the berries not ripened yet, but it has this really great kind of, uh, very cool minty uh, green and then they're, they are having ripened and these great red petioles. Um, but yeah, great architectural plant, looks a little like uh, a rhododendron. We have another uh, Asian plant, Quercus acata, uh, uh, acuta, next to this uh, Quercus rober. It's, uh, but it has this great dome shape to it. Um, 
beautiful evergreen. And we have quite a few, our oak collection, again, th these collections that we have are amongst the largest that you'd find in Ireland or Britain or Europe. So they're, they're quite extensive. So there's probably 110 different types of oaks that we have. And we have some very uh, beautiful ones that are evergreen, ones that come from the Azores, from Spain, um, don't lose, lose their leaves at all. This is one of our iconic trees, which is near the car park and will be coming into flower uh, in the next couple of weeks, um, Magnolia cambellii, subspecies Molecamata. Incredible. It's some years better than others, but uh, last year it was really great. It, what, the thing is, that if, if there's a frost, um, we lose the flower buds, but uh, really iconic looking. And then uh, this one here, which leads us back to Tony Hannon, uh, in 1956, the, um, the Irish State uh, Forestry Service purchased a bunch of uh, larch seedlings, or well, purchased seed from Japan and sowed them. Now, since 1956, the Arboretum was built nearly 10 years later. They, they were transferred, um, they were sown and um, grown in a, a nursery here in Wexford. And then those were included in the mixture of our shelter belt trees. And one of them had this very curious pendulous um, uh, characteristic to it. And so um, it became, it was named for, for Hannon uh, in tribute to him. And um, I'm not aware of how widely available it is. It is listed in the RHS Book of Conifers. And I know that at the time we had given them away to different societies. We have, the, the original plant is still, uh, is still growing there. It's, it's kind of hard to see because it's surrounded by trees. It, it has its own space but you wouldn't really notice it throughout the year until it, um, the leaves change. But uh, we do have three others which are um, near the Willow collection as well. But if anyone out there um, knows of any growing in gardens, uh, we'd be very interested in finding out. One of the great things as well, I mentioned that Hannon had traveled um, to different Arboretum and um, two of the notable ones that he did were the Morton Arboretum in Chicago and the Arnold Arboretum uh, in Boston. And myself and uh, my colleagues, along with our foreman, Kevin Naughton, went to uh, Boston maybe two years ago now to, uh, to sort of make that connection uh, back because we were basically based off of, as far as we can tell, kind of an amalgamation of the Morton and the Arnold. Um, the, we have a very similar, uh, I suppose we're a bit like the Morton in the size and the, the main road and uh, uh, the, the the Arnold had had, had their plants. They, they do them a bit differently. They have plants grown um, in terms of like from regions from around the world, whereas we grow our plants, um, the species altogether. But um, we wanted to make that connection. And so we went there to find out, you know, the standards of what an arboretum should be and what we should uh, achieve. And now the, the, the thing is that the Morton has an enormous, if they have... Um, huge uh, philanthropo, uh, philanthropic, philanthropist um, uh, drive for people. They have a lot of volunteers. So it's almost like a Disneyland uh, of Arboretum. And the Arnold is, is the second largest private um, fund in the world after the Vatican. It's, from, it's, it's an endowment from the Harvard University. So we're trying to punch above our weight. We, do, we certainly don't have the resources, the volunteer network or anything that they have. Um, but just to, in terms of the plants that are here, we have Franklinia, um, which is the flower there that's extinct in the wild. It's an American tree, um, uh, but they, they grow it very well there. And then the bottom right hand corner there is Acer grisium, which is a peeling bark maple. That's the uh, oldest uh, specimen outside of uh, its natural range. It's, 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 I suppose it's oldest specimen in, um, in the Western world, which is it would be nearly 100 years old. So I mentioned earlier that, um, that we are involved with uh, various aspects of research. This is a photo of our seed room. So we're part of an index seminum, which is an agreement amongst large uh, gardens that have wild plants to, um, to share seeds to other uh, similar facilities that um, for, for nonprofit in order to, to ensure that there's um, uh, it ensured the conservation of plants. And I'll just mention a few of the projects that we'd have been involved with. Well, in, in terms of, of education, um, forestry students have been using the Arboretum for uh, quite a few years to understand growth rates in trees, as well as um, farmers who want to grow trees. 
Um, so the, um, what we're looking at here is um, Sequoia sempervirens, and this is a, a tree which you, would, you might consider to be a future forest tree. It has a um, very slow growth rate at first, picks up speed over time. So in the first 40 years of this plot, uh, the same amount of timber was put on in the last 10 years. So it's, it's, it's um, really picking up speed. It's maybe not the kind of tree that you would grow if you want a cash crop, but um, it's certainly something that could be considered. Um, it's a very, uh, uh, quite a good timber. And um, the other thing I would, would say about it is that um, uh, fire resistant, um, it's, 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 quite, it's quite a spectacular tree, but is anyone gonna wait around 50, 60, 70 years for it to, to grow, who can say? Also very good at um, sequestering carbon because of its growth. In the 1980s, there was um, a trial uh, at the Arboretum, and the plot is still there uh, to look at the adaptability of elm and its resistance to Dutch elm disease. And um, cultivars uh, were tested to, to see what was um, what had had that ability. And uh, like I said, a lot of the trees are still still on the site. We have a very important uh, area where we grow. Uh, a, so we have forestry trees, but then we have provenance trees as well. Provenance trials. And you look at the map there, you can see all the way from the top of Alaska down to California, that's the entire range that the Sitka spruce grows. And we have a project um, where the, from dozens of sites, seed, seed was sampled from dozens of different sites all the way from that range, sown and grown in plot at the Arboretum. And uh, what it does is it actually gives you the ability to walk from California to Alaska and observe how these plants grow differently in different regions. And that's not specifically, that's, that's a, it's a genetic thing. It's, it's certainly related to um, the environment that they're in. In California, it's, the weather's nice. The tree grows all throughout the year. In Alaska, it has short summer months in which uh, Sitka grows. And then it basically kind of stops growing through the winter months. But just because we take the seed from Alaska and we bring it to Ireland and we say, well, it's actually quite nice here. Maybe it'll grow all throughout the year. It doesn't do that. It's genes actually put a hold on it. And I know that there are projects um, right now that um, Colin Kelleher from the Botanic Gardens is involved with in conjunction with um, Chagas to analyze the genes of some of these trees to look at whether you can select out in, in terms for forestry to select ahead of time what will what trees will create um create plants that will be um that will be good i, I, I suppose uh ones that will um that will grow straight and have have uh, uh have a, a certain um certain growth rate have a certain type of denseness of, of wood and can you do that before having a plot and selecting out the trees by saying that's going to be a good one get rid of that one those will be good so that, that's a large research project that's, um, that is involved at the moment. In the past, um, Jerry Douglas, uh, who was working out of Concealy, um, at, which is um, just north of Dublin, an old Chagas facility, had been involved in trying to ensure that um, the trees, the ancient trees in Ireland, the genetic resource is uh, preserved. So he worked with Trinity College and um, grafted went and found some of the oldest um, examples of ash oak um, elm and sycamore and grafted them to be able to have as a backup resource um, so if we're looking at something like the king oak in Tullamore, there is likely a genetic uh, element for why the oldest trees uh, have survived through all these years something that's allowed them to perhaps resist um, pests and diseases that have been introduced into the country uh, over the years, resist the worst of the storms um, and possibly by good luck resisting the, the, the saw. Um, so uh, we, have, uh, we have quite a few uh, plants from that uh, ancient tree collection growing throughout. And uh, we ha host uh, uh, sort of tree conferences. This is a, an example that uh, from last year where they brought uh, uh, this device out, so it's a drone which flies over forestry and analyzes infrared data on trees, and it's able to pick up on changes in, uh, like basically color changes, and the color changes are indications that some trees may be under stress. The, st the stomata on the leaves are opening or closing, 
and the plant is able to tell you whether they're, uh, or sorry, the, the drone is able to give you information to see whether area, uh, trees are being um, stressed. This would be something that we have uh, in our arboretum. One of the problems of growing plants closely together of the same genus or the same species is that you can get, um, if you don't have enough airflow, you can get diseases jumping between the two of them. So a lot of our, um, our spruces can be affected by this. <clears throat> And um, in terms of pests, um, this this little uh, creature here, Paris Perop citerna, <laughs> which is uh, Australian Tasmanian pest, has been seen in Ireland, and um, it does affect ours. I've never seen one myself, but I've seen the leaves that have these little notches cut out, and they um, there's a real worry that this can affect the um, the forestry that people are, are growing um, eucalyptus for uh, energy generation for um, uh, for burning so uh, so I guess what, what's good is that is that these things can get spotted sometimes the first place where a disease it appears in Ireland actually would be at the John F Kennedy Arboretum but it sort of gives you a sense of what's going to happen uh, what could happen in the rest of the country I'm going to sort of close off <clears throat> just talking a little bit about conservation and a project that we're involved in looking towards the future the International Conifer Conservation Program was established in 1991 by the uh, Edinburgh Botanics, um, and they are interested in um, in preserving uh, these uh, uncommon kind of plants in our in our world. But first, I'll uh, make you a little bit sad with some unfortunate stats about trees in general. 10% of our tree species are threatened. That doesn't actually sound like very much, but um, that would account for something like 10,000 different um, species around the world. And overall, the original forests that would be that have been around the world, 46 of them are gone, which is a home to 80% of plants and animals. And if we're looking a little closer to home here, that would be half of Europe's trees are under threat. And if we're going even closer down into conifers, that's one third of the some 800 species uh, are under threat. And the major causes are things you probably have all heard of before. Development, the demand for uh, timber, um, the demand for uh, resources that are underneath forests. Um, you might have heard of the term, the phrase, local actions have global consequences and global actions have local consequences. If there's a demand for teak on one side of the world, then that's gonna have an effect on what local people are doing in forests on another part of the world. Uh, and then if that, uh, if, if an area is harvested, say a forest, those um, local act, those um, actions that happen far away have an effect now that the forest is no longer there and no longer has its ability to deal with climate change, to deal with um, heat stresses, to, to deal with, uh, you know, drought. It doesn't filter uh, pollution. It doesn't, fil doesn't create water any longer or, or create, um, possibility of, of streams. So uh, development can be a, a major problem. Pollution, definitely from, like I, I was saying, when people are trying to extract gold or oil, um, bitumen, things that are underneath the forest, the forest is, is a secondary thing. It gets it gets cut, cut out. And, and those are very um, toxic. Uh, they leave the landscape quite, um, uh, quite poisoned. We've already mentioned uh, pests and diseases, but with the globalized world that we live in now, lots of things are moving around. Uh, that would, in the ease of it, uh, this wouldn't have happened in the past. And of course, climate change, um, the, this kind of ever-present thing, which is going to change the way our, our, um, our world is and is having immediate effects on the, um, the ecosystem all throughout the world. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of give you a little quiz here. This is, um, these are wild monkey puzzles in Chile, uh, kind of surrounded by uh, a forest of Nothophagus. And I'll ask you this question here. How many monkey puzzles died in a two week period in 2015? You can all have a little think of what, what that number might be. But did you know that it would have been 1.5 million? Um, these trees are, 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 have evolved to be resistant to fire and fire is actually a good thing in most forest ecosystems periodically. It allows um, the forest to regenerate. It allows seed, new new generation of seed to germinate. Um, it's not a bad it's it's not a bad thing at all. However, uh, subsequent uh, dr massive drought and um, and forest fires and subsequent forest fires 
these trees were never meant to be exposed to that type of thing. So the Conifer Conservation Project is, uh, is involved in trying to get as much uh, wild material of the broadest, um, I suppose the bro broadest level of genotypes, that the most locations, like I mentioned earlier with the Sitka spruce, um, there, there could be features in these different locations that the plants have. And um, we're going to be growing quite a few. Since 1991, the Conifer Conservation Project has planted about 20,000 trees in 426 sites in Ireland and the UK. And um, today, about 12,000 of that remain. There's always going to be uh, death of trees over time. And, th and they're happy with that number, 12,000. But we are going to be planting in the, over the next few years, somewhere in the range of 2,000, at least, of, of all of these rare uh, threatened conifers. So we're actually going to have uh, about 14% of the entire project growing here um, in Wexford, which is, I think, a real boon to the local people and to the conservation um, here in Ireland. These are just a few of the plants that um, that we are going to be um, growing. Fitzroy Capersoides in the top left there from Chile. Um, that was introduced um, uh, by uh, William Lobb of Vetch Nurseries in the 1840s. Um, but they found recently, so it's it's kind of an uncommon tree you find in old estates, um, but they found that almost all of the trees throughout Britain and Ireland were clones of one another. If it was introduced by seed at other times, they likely would have died off. So they were almost all clones. So there was a project to find out which plants were clones and find out which ones were different uh, introductions of seed from a different time. And we're going to be growing, I think there's... Um, I think there's 96 different types, and we'll be growing all of them um, at the Arboretum. Toria taxifolia grows along, uh, it's like in the Appalachians, um, going from Georgia uh, into Florida uh, along this river. It's affected by, uh, it's, it's, there's only about a thousand individuals in the wild. Very few of them produce any seed. It's affected by a disease, um, um, a fungal disease that has made it... Uh, it's 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 wiping it out, but we um but that disease is not uh, in Ireland and not in Europe as far as I understand. So we'll be growing some of those. Cyadopides, the umbrella pine, uh, is from Japan. Uh, it has been over harvested uh, over time, and it has the population is now fragmented, so they're no longer um, close to one another. And then the final one here, Witheringtonia whiteii. This is a, a Malawi plant from Africa. <clears throat> this is one of the sadder things. Um, this is used a lot in, um, it's harvested for furniture and paneling, and fence posts. If anyone saw um, Nolene Smith's talk uh, the other week, she mentioned about how we shouldn't be using these important trees for benches and fence posts. But uh, in 2014, uh, on this one mountainside, there were 38,000 alive. And in 2017, there were seven mature individuals. So our effect on the world is, um, is really... Um, it's it's it, it is crazy and the demand for harvesting our natural resources is is enormous so here they are in our nursery here i think that in the front there that's cephalotaxis wilsonii growing happily even though there's a bit of snow there and there are cyanopides in the front there in their nursery these are the ones that need a few more years before they can be planted out and this is the site here the elm adaptability trial is actually on, on the left hand side there and it's a 10 acre site <clears throat> it's kind of virgin land i mean it's been it's been farmed i mean sheep have been on it but it hasn't ever been planted here and when we dug drainage holes just to see what what it was like the topsoil goes down a meter sometimes more so it's actually it's going to be a very well suited site and here's some uh, images kind of an artist rendition of what it would be like in the future hopefully an accessible region and it won't consist just of conifers uh, the idea is that we would also grow around those species the same plants that would grow with them in their natural range of North America and of uh, South America, of Africa, what have you. I'll sort of finish off here and just say that we're trying to um, uh, reach more people in, in, in different ways. So we're going to be doing a series of videos. We've started one. There's one that's on our, our Facebook page from last November. But um, as the season starts to go on, we'll be doing more called Arb Speak, which um, the theme is preserving the past and planting for the future. So these will be short videos talking about a bit about what I talked about today, but maybe going into a little more detail on um, how we manage the Arboretum and, and the importance of, of conservation. So I, I encourage you to uh, keep an eye out for that.
So uh, yeah, closing off here, uh, it's a very, um, it's it's still a very daunting uh, job uh, task, and uh, but it's very exciting. You know, there's just so much that can be done uh, to to preserve this 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 heritage legacy, and it's something that the people in the country should be very very proud of. And and in in the future, I mean, our ties with the National Botanic Gardens, who manage us, and Kilmacura will continue to grow. And the idea would be that the the place becomes an officially a, a national arboretum um, for the country. So th these are things that uh, I'm looking forward to in the future. So with that, I'd like to thank you and my dog Wilson here, who's a big fan of Georgie, Georgie Brown and uh, Tony Kirkham's book on essential pruning techniques. And I'm, I'm very uh, open to answering any questions um, that you might have. <clears throat> um, yeah, any kind of questions I'm, 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 I'm here for a little bit. <clears throat> Thank you very much for everyone. We have people here from um, Montreal, all throughout Europe. Thank you all very much. Um, there's some more, there's a few questions that I'll be answering in a minute here. Yeah, let's see here. I can, well, I can see all the, I can actually see all the questions here. <clears throat> So let's see, uh, what's the difference between an arboretum and a botanical garden? Um, there, there really, there, there isn't except for the, the idea that an arboretum, we only, um, we only, our, 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 our main, um, our main goal is to, uh, is just to grow trees and shrubs. That's sorry. That's the, uh, taking a long way around of saying it. Um, the botanical gardens will grow alpine plants and they'll grow uh, hothouse plants and they'll grow plants from the desert. We're limited to what can grow. Uh, a, a good arboretum should be growing plants that they're able to grow um, in the climate that they have. And also looking forward uh, in terms of um, what can grow here. The, the climate in Ireland, let's just say in the last 20 years, has changed massively. There's probably plants that they tried to grow in 1968 that died. But actually, could could survive um, could survive here na nowadays. Now let's see. Let me take a look at a few of these questions here. I, I haven't had a chance to look. How is the public reaction to the removal of shelter belts? Is it done gradually? Explained to visitors or quickly? Have you seen from other sites that visitors get attached to their familiar treescapes and may not react well to removals if not clearly explained? Well. everything and to make it to make it barren um I, do, I don't know that there has been um i don't think that people are i don't know uh what people think of it <laughs> i mean I, I i understand the idea of using of having these as um 